Yo, yo, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the FMA Dumpster Fire podcast discussing issues we pretend, we like to pretend, don't exist. Today's topic, a divisive one. We're going to talk about Panantukan. We're going to talk about Suntukan. We're going to talk about dirty boxing. <clears throat> Guys, I have seen enough forum discussions on its origins. Who cares? All right. For the most part, I think where the narrative is headed is that Panantukan, Suntukan, Dirty Boxing was a creation of Filipino martial arts instructors in the West, meaning to say it may not or it does not likely have a documented historical context in the Philippines. This was something that people from the Philippines or have connections to FMA in the West, right, have created. That dominates the conversation, where it came from, what its origin is. Is it Filipino martial arts? Is, is it even Filipino martial arts? That is what generates hundreds and hundreds of commentary. That is what generates a ton of conversation online. But what isn't necessarily the focus of the discussion is how do we actually functionalize Panantukan? Now I'm going to share a video with you guys here today. This was shared on the FMA discussion forum and uh, everyone's talking about this guy and his video is titled functionalizing your panantukan i watched the video i'm going to save you the trouble um it is a 12 minute video that starts off predictably with the first six minutes really talking about how everyone else is doing it wrong and here he is with some plans on, on how to functionalize Panantukan. Unfortunately, dude took 12 minutes, almost 13 minutes, to talk about one thing, which was which was that your feeder has to offset the rhythm. That's it. I mean, that's part of the answer for sure, particularly in the fundamental stages of development while you're lightly tapping. Sure, that's part of it. Uh, the thing that he bashes, though, that is still part of the same thinking is, you know, the slow, methodical, calculated, predictable phase of learning. That's as important as this phase, as far as I'm concerned. But it's still not functionalizing Panantukan. He mentioned some things here. I'm going to play the video a little bit. Um, just, just pay attention. Some things to note, okay? So let's listen up. You're learning all these different skills, but you have to break those pieces down, okay? Sure. So the first one I'm going to show you guys is just a basic inside goon team. The basic inside goon team, goon team means to scissor. Okay. And it just simply is hitting and destroying the bicep, causing pain, hurting the arm, and hopefully deadening the arm. Notice I said hopefully I deadening the arm for a moment where their hand drops. So now they only have one hand and two legs. Okay, let's uh, <clears throat> let's talk about that. I've never ever witnessed a deadening of the arm outside of a demo where Uke wants his arm to die so that he can help prove Master's point. Ow! Ugh. We've seen those demos, right? In any combat sport, you know, whether it be the UFC or boxing or even bare knuckle boxing. We have yet to witness a deadening of the arm because of a good thing. Um, so anyway, after about six minutes, he gets to the point. Here's the point of the video. I said, and he hit that as hard as he wants because I got this big old pad on my arm. Okay? See that? And even when he's doing it, I feel it through the pad, but it feels good. Oh, yeah. Okay? He's slipping out of the way. I'm coming in. Sorry, I should probably bit, show that. that. Make sure you stay over there. Just right, like that. Let me just rewind you know, I feel it through the pad, that. but it feels good. Oh, yeah. Okay, he's slipping out of the way. I'm coming in. Let's move around a little bit. Go that. Make sure you stay over there. Just like that. Oh, notice I'm in range of hitting him. That's that, cool. That's, That's the first thing it. you need to notice. I'm coming in, 
and I'm trying to punch him in his face. No, you're not. Okay? He's hitting my hand. This is a thing I am not seeing. It needs to change. Come on, bro. You are not punching on target. Okay, so that's... I mean, even your fist there. It, I mean, what's going on here? Right? You got, a, you got a lazy fist going. You're not really trying to punch him in the head. Let's be real. You know, okay, project. so that's the that's the for the jab. Now go ahead and do the goon team for the cross. Bam, just like that. See how he's moving off to the side. I'm trying to punch him in the face. Come over here. I'm trying to punch him in the face. No, you're not, bro. That's the main point I'm trying to make. You today. are not trying to punch I'm trying him in the face. Trying to punch him in his face. How? Okay. Is that? Don't leave your arm out like that. I just did that for fun. Oh. But I'm here, bam, I just did just that like for fun. Look, man. Let's just stop this nonsense. Even in his own demo, even in his own edit, he says he does it for fun, leaving his arm up there. I get it. The thing is, these are all stages of learning. I didn't like how he spent the first six minutes bashing training methodologies that <laughs> even beyond his control, he does. There is no, look, look at the placement of his thumb. It's, it's on the outside. It's real lazy. The targets are, I mean, the shots are barely on target. The trajectory is to facilitate the slip. So he's not trying to punch him in the face. He's not. And uh, again, kudos to him. I'm not trying to pick on Sean Elders, okay? It's just that this was the topic of <clears throat> discussion, uh, FMA discussion. This was the centralized focus, so I thought I would address it. See that? He's boontaining me. He's hitting my arm for real. No, he's not. not. For He's not hitting your arm for real, though, because you're not throwing that punch for real. So he's not hitting your arm for real. And I don't care how animated you sound. You're not doing what you say you're doing. And Okay, let's move around a little bit. Come over there a little bit. Same thing. Good. This I'm changing rhythms. That's good. You are changing your rhythm. That's good. Okay. So, but look at that last punch. Are you gonna tell me that last punch was for real on target, bro? You're you're gonna stand here and you're gonna claim that everyone else is doing it wrong and you're doing it right, and yet. A little bit. Is that really a, is that on target? Look at this last punch. It was barely even in range. Look at that. This last one right here. Notice I'm changing rhythms. Okay. That last one. Come on. So you. So anyway, this is my issue, man. Is that like everyone seems to have an answer for this, but even in this guy's demonstration, he wasn't really doing the things he says he was doing. He wasn't really trying to punch that guy in the face. That guy wasn't actually trying to punch his bicep as hard as he can. He did change his rhythm and cadence, which is incredibly important in the initial stages of learning how to functionalize Panantukan. By the way, I'm not an expert in Panantukan. I'm not an expert in Suntukan. I'm just sort of a pro. I don't even... I mean, I know that good thing. I know using your elbows to intercept fists because it's going to make their hand explode. Um, yeah, I've, I've heard all, all of those things. Look, in the fundamental stages, you need to learn the mechanics, right? So perhaps mimicry first, right? Just going through the motions without fully understanding it. Layering in elements that progress the drill, like he mentioned, right? Offsetting your cadence. Yeah offsetting your speed, trying to hit on target, and then layering in other things, you know, on top of that. So instead of compartmentalizing the good thing, maybe the guy can throw um, more freely different combinations, and he actually has to search for when the appropriate stimulus comes in to apply uh, the particular concept that you're working on. So as we continue to layer and layer and layer all of these things, remember, I'm not saying what this guy did or said was necessarily wrong, but it wasn't the final, nowhere near the final stage of functionalizing Panantukan or Sotukan. And on top of that, he was making the very same mistakes that he took six minutes to criticize others 
um, for doing it wrong. Kudos to him. He didn't name any names. He didn't do anything like that. But this is this is like look. I've made I with a guy named Josh Caputo. I've made a video criticizing the very same thing, and that is typically um, when people are not teaching Panamtukan correctly. And again, I'm no expert. All right, I'm just kind of approaching this from a logical standpoint. But if you want to functionalize something, then you have to you have to make real the stimulus coming in, and that's just not happening. So I've said uh, in previous videos, your strike has to be on target, right? The speed can be progressively elevated, but even if you're doing Panantukan slowly, it does you no good. It, it, the feeder does the practitioner no good by punching offline. It, there's just no point in punching offline um, when you're trying to work on Panantukan defenses, right? So to my point, we're approaching the 11 minute mark to my point the only way to functionalize panantukan or santukan whatever it is is to spar maybe we begin with light sparring using compartmentalized um feeds to extract the skills that we're trying to learn like, but we're actually still lightly sparring and we're trying to do these uh we're trying to execute these concepts under some semblance of uh, time pressure, right? Um, and then beyond that, it's just sparring. You kind of layer on the difficulty. You lay, you increase the intent. You increase the speed. You increase the power. You add a healthy dose of competitive energy, and then we'll see if these things work. Now, a lot of the things in Panantukan, and this is this is the ultimate excuse of why these masters don't use it in sparring. Uh, is because there are artificialities in sparring. You're not going to get the full effect of whatever it is that you're trying to do. As an example, if I'm trying to, if I'm trying to intercept that punch and I'm trying to meet their knuckle with my elbow somehow, right? Right, very common. If we're wearing gloves, the effects of that are going to be, for the most part, mitigated if not completely erased so how do we know that that tactic has worked under a sparring format in the absence of pain penalties well you film it videotape it record it on your phone in slow motion let's figure out if it was incidental accidental or purposeful and if it was purposeful under what conditions were we able to access that and apply it into uh, a, a more realistic context than just mitt work or you know lightly tippity tapping each other, right? Um, and then we move on from there, man. Like if you wanted, I suppose you can remove your gloves and then put head protection on the guy that you're trying to punch, right? Therefore, we can actually see and maybe go a little bit lighter. We can actually see to what degree is punching someone's elbow really going to stop an attacker. And the the, the thing is. There's more to this stew that makes it convoluted, right? Because is Panantukan not meant to be a sport? Um, can it be tested in a sportive um, context? I don't know. Probably, right? Um, but again, you have to use the available technologies. We're moving forward with Filipino martial arts, guys. Um, all of these claims are finally being tested. Look, when you stick spar and it's meant to be a sword, right? You've accepted the artificiality of the training context. I know when I hit you with a stick, your head's not actually going to get cut off. So in that way, we've already accepted these limitations in training methodologies in Filipino martial arts. So if you want to learn Panantukan, if you want to be good at Suntukan, you have to spar. Just as sparring is the only way to really get good at Filipino martial arts. It's the only way to really get good at using a, a stick. Even, even a modified or a contextualized spar has lots to offer um, for self-defense applications because really what you're managing is serious speed, man. Like for real energy and that, that, that competitive drive, that competitive spirit mm -hmm. pulsing through that exercise you are going to get really, really good at distance management 
range, awareness, um, and even, even sensitivity. I know we have all of these sensitivity drills, but it, on the higher plane, you can still develop craft and, and learn a lot about your ability to identify sensitivity through sparring. It's not the best way to develop sensitivity for sure, right? It's probably a few notches below that at that optimal learning pace. But still, you got to know, right? So all of you Panantukan, all of you Suntukan guys out there, it is not impressive whatsoever to see um, these alive drills, especially if we know you've been doing it for some time. In the absence of footage from you, or your students actually sparring, for me, it's the same kind of shit. It's the same kind of nonsense, right? Um, and, and again, it look, I know that a lot of people believe in Panantukan, a lot of people believe in Suntukan because they have anecdotal evidence, because they have personal stories or they've heard personal stories of it saving lives or whatever. And so because of this, they don't feel the need to functionalize these skill sets for themselves because clearly at work, Master told me that he used it in five fights. You cannot rely upon that same kind of anecdotal evidence, that kind of love and trust that you have for your Master that something works if you're not going to take this up for yourself on your own. Then you're only kidding yourself. And look, I will say this, I'm going to start doing this too, right? I love boxing. I've fallen in love with it. I'm not very good at it. And I spar probably less frequently than I should, but I spar um, in boxing. It's not, it's not fun, and I know it's not fun. So really the key is finding good training partners who can um, modulate their level in accordance uh, to your needs. And hopefully that's a give and take kind of a relationship. Yeah, I hope you have good training partners, uh, sparring partners, but to, to functionalize Panantuka, there really is no other way. And so when I begin sharing some footage of me and my crew, shout out the boudoir, you know, I'm probably looking at someone like a Mark Medeiros, Joe Apostol, Justin, even James, you know, who's a grappler. Um, it's gonna look ugly, man. When when we begin showing the when the boudoir crew begin showing our Panantukan videos, it's gonna look messy. It, it may be ridiculed. It may like that, that's not Panantukan. That just looks like two unskilled guys swinging. Well, maybe there's something to that. You know, maybe the two unskilled guys swinging with intention is gonna knock the fuck out of you know the technically perfect. Panantukan expert um, because we spar. So anyway, leave me a leave me a comment if you've watched twenty minutes of this diatribe. This you know, standing on my soapbox here. I and mean, again, I'm not a pro, guys. Right? It's just that it's very easy for me as an outsider of Filipino martial arts who also happen to love Filipino martial arts very much. I travel the world. I speak with a ton of experts. I touch hands with these experts. I get my ass kicked and I learn a whole lot of things. And these things are universal. The things that I learn under a, a jujitsu or a wrestling context, the things that I learn in a boxing or in a Muay Thai context, all of these things are FMA to me. You know, I'm taking what they teach me and I'm applying it to my FMA practice because as far as I can see, when you look at something like a BJJ, a wrestling, a boxing, a Muay Thai, even, even Taekwondo, you know, right? When they have a healthy community of fighters, right, albeit within a given set of rules, standardized rules to ensure fairness, they're still going at it in a way that more Filipino martial artists should be doing, right? We should be competing more. Um, we should be sparring more. We should be more critical of the things that are being fed to us. Not to say that it's bullshit, right? That's never going to be my, my conclusion in the examination of anything to say that that is bullshit. Um, 
What I will say is that if you continue to train Panantuka and just using mitt work and air drills and, and these slow, consensual, highly collaborative formats, I can say in my examination of other arts, other systems, and practically anything else in life, that if you don't test your knowledge, if you do not alchemize your wisdom into skill, then at least be honest that for the most part, all you have is an academic understanding of a particular concept. And that's perfectly fine. We can learn from those people. You can absolutely learn from somebody who's never disarmed a guy who was trying to attack him with a knife on how to disarm knives. For God's sake, like the people that astronauts trust to bring them into space aren't astronauts themselves, right? So there's something to be said about this academic scholarly type wisdom, right? We take that in and then we take in advice from people who have done it for real. And then we sort of create our own cocktail of, um, beliefs that ought to carry with it training methodologies so that we can verify these truths that we've been given. So that's it for today, guys. Thank you very much. If you enjoy the FMA Dumpster Fire podcast, if you enjoy FMA Source, my personal journey into the Filipino martial arts, please consider hitting that uh, subscribe button. Um, Maybe even hit that notification bell. When you hit subscribe, um, the likelihood of you seeing my videos when I make them goes up higher. It, it gives me a little bit of support as well. Um, every subscriber counts. You know, hopefully, I get to monetize this channel soon. Maybe earn some a little bit of uh, ad revenue from it. But if you hit that notification bell, um, I believe you get an email or or some sort of alert whenever a new video is coming up um i really really appreciate it like i said this channel is currently not monetized hopefully one day it will be and as i continue to do these videos you know if i get like 50 bucks a month or something like that buy me a new night um or i'm gonna i'm gonna there's one there's one guy who's managed to catch this right now uh cali combat systems is it possible to spar upon and took at speed with boxing gloves. It works to start with an isolation sparring when one is feeding punches at the speed track. Yeah, so look, Panantukan appears to me to have quite a vast library of concepts and techniques, right? Not all of those things are going to work as optimally as the other while wearing boxing gloves. But again, if you film it, then you can you can analyze, you can, you can access um, information that may not necessarily be available to the naked eye. Um, so yeah, utilize slow motion. Look for those moments. And again, it's going to require effort because a lot of Panantukan is actually just things that happen in boxing. Like that's the reality. So Panan, there's, a, there's many Panantukan techniques that are really things that just happen in boxing. This includes trapping. This includes headbutts. This includes elbows. This includes practically everything in Panantukan has happened in boxing. It's just that boxers and boxing choose a reductionist approach to perfect more or less four or five punches in all the surrounding skill sets needed to execute them. This is what makes them effective. They're not trying to learn friggin', you know, 45 moves. They've got five punches. And so they're really, really good at those five punches. And in working those five punches, then they're able to work the supporting skill sets needed to execute on them. So, yes, absolutely possible to work Panantukan with boxing gloves. And. He says, I've done that and I do that with my students. To be honest, though, using good things in sparring, I would put a low percentage technique and that's sticking to the Panantuka and boxing fundamentals. You know, that's actually a great point. Like when I do knife sparring or when I do stick sparring, I tend to avoid techniques that would be just potentially, you know, fight enders, right? I avoid those techniques when they aren't, powerful 
because I'm using a stick and I have a point to prove, you know? So like doing a little bleep and assuming that's a blade and I'm cutting his wrist, you know, that ain't enough for me, you know, trust the blade. Yeah. But I might as well add a healthy dose of speed and power behind it to trust myself. Um, so yeah, let's see. I think that's pretty much it. So there it is. Um, so yeah, I, I finally remembered my point. So yeah, when you're trying to do a good thing with boxing gloves, yeah, it's not going to hurt your opponent. It's not going to have any effect on their ability to continue um, their offense. But when you look back at it, you can go, okay, that was a little victory for me. He continued to punch, but you can kind of extrapolate and go, okay, well, maybe that would have, you know, that thing that I did would have had a more pronounced effect had we not been wearing gloves. And then you can go on imagining these amazing scenarios, right? I can tell you I've more or less stopped doing that shit. Like when I'm in a stick fight, it's pretty much a stick, right? Um, sometimes actually what happens is I get some, some comfort. I get comforted when I get my ass handed to me like, oh, okay, well, at least if that was a sword, I think I would have cut his belly. You know, I, I do these things. I think it's important to psychologically um, – give yourself a hug <laughs> especially when you're sparring a lot and you're competing a lot you're you're gonna get defeated and so i fully understand that once in a while we review footage of ourselves getting our asses kicked and then we find these like emotional tethers right that, that keep us grounded on the positive because like sure i'm getting <laughs> i'm getting my face punched but you know, my stick is right up against his belly, so technically I would be cutting him in half. But really, I got my face smacked. Um, and that's what it'll require. It'll require you getting your face smashed for you to be able to functionalize uh, your Panamtuka. Otherwise, hey, what I, what I didn't really address, what I didn't really discuss, is that if that's outside the realm of your intention to functionalize Panamtuka and you're just enjoying yourself, um, in the Filipino martial arts, and you're just enjoying Panatuka and Ensuntuka as an element of your complete studies of the Filipino martial arts, and you have no interest in fighting, you have no interest in sparring, then that's 1,000% absolutely okay. And I support that wholeheartedly. You know, not everybody wants to... Um, not everybody wants to functionalize the knowledge, right? And, and that's another thing that we need to be really honest about because, you know, functionalizing something is, is really like a, a high value term in, in martial arts, right? You don't want to, nobody wants to learn anything on the surface level, but that's not, that's not the truth. We all learn things in our martial arts journey that remain on the surface level. And we, and we learn these things as part of our total enjoyment of the art and that's a thousand percent cool as long as we're honest with it and I, and I think people have difficulty with being honest and because you know what because we've been attacked right and I say we because I'm a part of it too I learn things that I know is just for me is just for my enjoyment of the art is just for artistic self-expression and that I, I don't need to try to wrap that enjoyment and try to justify it to other people who, who have different training goals than me, right? Like, okay, you're, you're a hardcore dude. You fight a lot. I don't, man, All right? So let me learn my spin kick, right? Because I want to learn spin kicks. It doesn't mean it's going to be my choice for self-defense, right? That's, that's you trying to impose your sensibilities onto me. It doesn't mean I'm going to train it to a functional degree. I don't need to do that. I maybe just, I just enjoy throwing it out there, you know, and for fun. Hey, Aluizio, hello, Gian, PTTA uh, from Brazil here. How are you? Thank you very much for joining. Um, yeah, and, man, the Brazilians, for example, right? I think what I know about the Brazilians is maybe, maybe, maybe they care less about the art and more about the function, the functionalizing of these concepts. And again, that's beautiful. That's perfect, right? But if we're going to talk about functionalizing Panamtukan, for example, look, this has been 30 minutes of me talking about functionalizing Panamtukan, and it could all have been very simplified with two words, just 
spar. Just box. And that's it. Thank you all very much for your time. Again, please hit that subscribe button. This channel is growing fairly decently, actually. So thank you very much for your support. Um, thank you very much for your time. Um, I, I appreciate it when you leave a comment. I appreciate it when you hit that like button very, very much. Again, it's because it just helps me get noticed. It helps me get noticed. People are creating more and more Filipino martial arts content. So when you subscribe to me, when you hit that notification bell, when you hit like, when you leave a comment, it just tells YouTube that, you know, this guy has, this guy has something that I like. All right. You don't have to like the whole thing, but that's really what it says. And that's why I appreciate it. And that's why I encourage you. If any of these videos have any value whatsoever to just hit that subscribe button for me um, and stay tuned for the next video. All right. So thank you guys very much. And, uh, have yourself a great day. This has been another episode of the FMA Dumpster Fire.